our uh, presentation today is nutrition in the PKD pediatric population. There we go. Okay. Um, here's our activity disclaimer for the PKDF Foundation. Here's our disclosure. I personally do not have any financial disclosure to share with you. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a registered dietitian. I'm board certified as a specialist in renal nutrition. I went to school at Boston University, graduated back in 2000. I've worked at Boston um, Children's Hospital for about 19 years now. I currently follow the pediatric population of kids with chronic kidney disease, on dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and through the transplant process. I thoroughly enjoy um, working with children. Um, I've been doing this for many years. It, it brings me great joy to see kids reach their nutrition and growth goals. Um, when I'm not at work, I enjoy doing all the things outdoors uh, with my family and dogs. And that's a disclaimer that I do have two dogs that hopefully behave um, through this process. No guarantees. So our objectives today, we're, we're a pretty small group, so I'm gonna keep this pretty casual. Feel free to um, you know, interrupt, uh, ask any questions throughout this presentation. Um, or we can save it for the end, whatever, whatever works best. Um, but first, we're going to talk about the general dietary recommended recommendations for PKD, identify any challenges children with PKD may have uh, to achieve adequate nutrition and growth, and identify methods to optimize growth and nutrition, and then review nutritional supplements for the pediatric population. So is there a recommended diet for PKG? There isn't a specific diet for polycystic kidney disease. They're just general recommendations that then become more individualized based on a patient's kidney function. So according to the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, the general recommendations uh, to follow include, first of all, seek consult consultation from a registered dietitian for individualized guidance because it is very individualized um, based on uh, the disease state, electrolytes, um, urine output. Um, every child is different. So, but typically we start off with limiting sodium in one's diet. We talk about maintaining adequate hydration. Again, that's very individual. Moderate amounts of high quality protein are encouraged. And then as disease progresses, potentially restricting potassium and phosphorus in the, in the diet. And then if started on dialysis, protein needs increase due to increased losses through, um, through the dialysis process. So why is a modified diet with PKD indicated? So PKD can lead to a progressive decline in the kidney's function, where the fluid-filled cysts that form on the kidney can make the kidneys larger and cause them to not work as well. PT PKD can be painful, causing a decrease in appetite. So if any of our pediatric um, patients have pain or discomfort, nausea, vomiting, any of that, really their first thing to go is the appetite. And then it's really difficult to get, uh, to get in good nutrition with these kids. Once the kidney function begins to decline, decline, the kidneys are unable to filter certain nutrients and they begin to build up in the blood. So following a renal diet, which is typically low in sodium, potassium, and phosphorus, may be indicated at different stages in time for patients affected with PKD. It is very variable. So when we talk about the renal diet, and we put the renal diet in quotes um, for myself, and I work with another dietitian with this particular population at Boston Children's, we, we say that very loosely because we do have specific education materials that we review with our patients, but it is very individual and no education session really looks the same with any one family or, or patient. Um, so that's why we, we loosely say a renal diet. But we do start off with sodium. It's usually the easiest to tackle. Sodium, there does need to be adequate intake in order to um, 
maintain neurological development and growth at, for the younger children. But it, later on, it may need to be restricted to control blood pressure and maintain a euvolemic um, fluid status. And then sometimes may need to be supplemented in certain disorders due to sodium wasting. When talking about limiting sodium intake, we talk about where it's found in our diets. So 10% of our sodium intake is naturally occurring in just the food that we eat. And then five to 10% is added while, while cooking or at the table, just generally salting our food. But a majority of the sodium intake, 75%, is added by manufacturers during the processing of foods. Sodium can enhance flavor, it controls the growth of bacteria, and it acts as a preservative. So when we talk about reducing sodium intake in a patient's diet, we encourage choosing fresh, um, fresh or frozen vegetables without sauces. Some of the added cream sauces or cheese sauces can be very high in sodium. And then canned vegetables can sometimes be pretty high in sodium as well. We review how to read a food label and we encourage choosing foods that are low in sodium. And by low, we mean less than 140 milligrams per serving. We suggest decreasing salt added to foods at the table. And we actually suggest not even having a salt shaker on the table just so that they're not um, inclined to use it. Watch for ingredients in salt substitutes. Some families may opt to choose a salt substitute because they're missing salt so much. Uh, but many times salt substitutes may use potassium as a substitute. And if on a potassium restricted diet, that's not um, a great substitute. So instead we encourage using fresh herbs and spices to flavor foods, uh, taste better anyway. We encourage limiting fast food intake as fast food can be very high in sodium. And then the food quality isn't great um, for our, our pediatric population or any population really. So for protein in the renal diet, we don't say necessarily limiting protein as in restricting pro protein. We just encourage uh, providing protein to the um, DRI. And so for some people that may be just decreasing the amount in their diet to slow down the advancement of CKD. And by DRI, sorry, I meant uh, dietary reference intake for those who may not know what that means. Um, so it's, it's not a restriction. We just will go through what they are eating and maybe paring it down a little bit if there's excessive intake. Although some children who are on dialysis therapy have increased requirements of protein because protein is lost in the dialysis process. And then supplementation may be required for those who cannot meet their needs from foods or fluid alone. So here's the recommended dietary protein intake chart for children with chronic kidney disease stages three to five and 5D. And you can see um, as it progresses um, in stages and then onto hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, the protein intake uh, increases in comparison to the DRI because of the losses during dialysis. And then when we talk about protein, we break it down into animal protein sources and plant protein sources. I think when people think about protein, they immediately think about the animal sources where chicken, fish, meat, one serving is two to three ounces, where three ounces is, is typically about the size of the palm of your hands. An egg is a serving size or dairy, a half a cup of milk, yogurt, or one ounce of cheese. But then protein's also found in our plant-based foods uh, which is beans where one serving equals half a cup, nuts, one serving equals um, a quarter cup, and then some grains, some whole grains, and then some, some of the ancient cooked grains also are good sources of protein. And quality sources, so that these foods provide other nutrients, which is important. So then we talk about fluid. Fluid is very variable per individual, it really depends on the primary kidney disease what the residual kidney function is, how the urine output um, varies, the ability to concentrate urine is important, and then the presence or absence of hypertension really comes into play when thinking about total fluid intake for the day. 
So we suggest consulting your, your child's uh, physician. We don't necessarily make that recommendation of how much fluid to drink a day. It, we really rely on the physician's um, input. But if perchance your child or yourself needs to be on a fluid restriction, we do have some general guidelines we talk about when we meet with our patients. We suggest paying attention to foods that are liquid or semi-liquid at room temperature that may not be considered fluid to some people, but actually count towards a fluid restriction. So things like um, an ice cream that melts to be a liquid at room temperature or jello, those really count towards your fluid intake. Or if eating a soup, um, that broth counts as well. We encourage drinking only when thirsty, which is tricky, of course. Um, I think a lot of people drink when they're in social situations or they're bored. Um, it's the thing that um, you know they may defer to. And especially when they're restricted, it's really a challenge. We encourage taking small amounts of fluid throughout the day using a small cup or a glass. For our pediatric patients, we'll provide like little small fun Dixie cups to use for their, um, for their fluid intake. Eating cold fruit is a good way to kind of satiate your thirst. A lot of our patients enjoy frozen grapes. Um, it can really be um, a nice way to, to alleviate that thirst. Chewing gum too can um, increase your saliva and then maybe take away some of that thirst feeling. Gargling with mouthwash or using a breast spray that may distract or, or decrease the thirst sensation. And then avoiding high sodium, spicy, and very sweet foods. Those can really make you feel, um, can make you really feel thirsty. I was meeting with a patient last week. He's a, um, a high schooler student. And we were talking about his fluid restriction. And he said the last week of school has been the easiest as far as following his fluid restriction, just because he's been so, he was so busy with school activities and getting things done that he was distracted and, and really didn't struggle with his fluid restriction so much. And so we talked about that kind of moving forward um, that uh, if he notices that he is bored or just sitting down, you know, with nothing to do and thinking about having a drink, but his, is really close to what his fluid restriction is to go do something, to kind of walk away from the situation to see if he can create some kind of activity that will distract him, knowing that that's worked for him in the past. So moving on to potassium, renal potassium excretion is usually maintained until your GFR or your glomerular filtration rate decreases to less than 15 milliliters per minute squared. Potassium is frequently restricted to prevent cardiac arrhythmias because if the potassium builds up too high in the blood, it can be really dangerous and cause an arrhythmia. Children on peritoneal dialysis or if they're on frequent hemodialysis sessions, we have a couple patients who need to be on dialysis more than three times a, a week for a variety of reasons. They may not need to restrict their potassium as much or it may even develop hypokalemia, depending on the diet and the foods that they eat as well. A majority of the potassium is found in fruits and vegetables, although it can be hidden in some other foods. Here's just a nice chart showing some examples of where some common foods fall in the range of potassium. So right now is berry season, so we're really encouraging our patients to eat the raspberries, the strawberries, blueberries. They're in season and they're delicious and they are a low potassium food. And then as we go up the line, peppers, peppers, cucumbers, those are, cucumbers is a lower potassium food, but it's really kid friendly. So we encourage those for um, a vegetable source. Our melons get to be high potassium. And then a lot of our patients really struggle with potatoes being a high potassium food and limiting those. Um, so sometimes we have to be really creative of how to get around that. So moving on to phosphorus, uh, levels um, in your blood are usually not elevated in the early stages of progressive um, chronic kidney disease. Elevated levels do have consequences for bone health and growth as well as long-term implications for cardiovascular disease. And bone mineralization may be impaired as early as stage two CKD with abnormal bone turnover by stage three. So we really try to 
um, control our phosphorus levels as soon as we see those start to creep up so that we um, can prevent that from happening. When we're educating our patients, our families on phosphorus and maybe had a limit in the diet, we really break down foods into inorganic sources of phosphorus and organic sources of phosphorus. Our inorganic sources are hidden or added phosphorus and they're found in our process, convenience and fast foods as well as canned and bottled drinks such as iced tea or iced coffee and then our, our dark sodas that some of our older kids may, may like to drink. Phosphorus is used um, to improve color in foods, flavor or stability and it's listed in the ingredients section on a food label and can be hidden sometimes so you really have to to read through the ingredients. Unfortunately, inorganic phosphorus has a higher intestinal absorption rate of greater than 90%. So when we talk about reducing phosphorus in your diet, we, we, this, these are the foods that we start with, because as you can tell by this picture here alone, uh, a lot of these foods don't have too much nutrition to offer that would benefit the patient. We really encourage um, high nutrient quality foods when, when looking at the diet as well. So then there's organic phosphorus, which is naturally occurring phosphorus, and it's found in our protein rich animal and plant products. Phosphorus is tricky because it's not typically found on the food label. So sometimes you have to dig around to find out where, uh, how much phosphorus is in a food. The issue with organic phosphorus is it, is the intestinal absorption is less. So it's 40 to 60%, which works in our favor. So it's not as much as absorbed and they're higher quality um, nutrient dense foods. So we rarely restrict these foods. These are the foods that we encourage. And as you can see, a lot of them are high protein foods as well, which is important for our kids who are on dialysis. When we do, or we um, perform our nutrition education, we typically teach families how to read a food label. It's pretty important to look at what you're, you're feeding your children or feeding yourself. Um, and we focus on quantity. So as a, for the, for the food label, ingredients are listed in order of predominance with ingredients used in the largest amount being first, and then they're followed in descending order. So that's important to note. And if you look at this particular food label, you can see that there's two sources of phosphorus um, high up on the list. So we would advise against our patients to um, choose this particular food item. So does your child need a vitamin or do you need a vitamin? So typically we, we look thoroughly at, um, at the diet first and if, if able to achieve a, a well-balanced diet, um, a vitamin may not be indicated. Although as uh, kidney disease progresses and if you or your child are started on dialysis, peritoneal or hemodialysis, we do start a vitamin that has um, all of our water soluble vitamins because these vitamins are lost during the uh, dialysis process. So it's really indicated then. Prior to that, it's really an individual decision looking at the diet um, to see if there's any deficits. During chronic kidney, disease, we're mindful of some vitamins that can be toxic. So we really are, um, we really are mindful of the decision of starting a, a patient on um, a vitamin. So when talking about decreasing certain foods, the diet, maybe because of a high potassium or a high phosphorus, we first start with our processed foods and our bottled beverages. If we can get rid of those in the diet and, and then increase the nutrient quality of the nutritional quality of the diet in the process, it's just a win-win. So we'll try to eliminate those processed foods first and then the bottled bever beverages like iced tea, iced coffee, dark sodas. And then as we move down the line, if a patient's um, phosphorus is really high, we won't eliminate dairy products ever. We just suggest maybe scaling back. We'll look at how much a particular patient is drinking. For example, another patient I met with last week, she tells me that she has um, a large cup of milk 
with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then also takes milk with her meds. So we started there and we talked about um, kind of a more appropriate age um, dose of, or serving size of milk to have. And, um, and then we'll see what her phosphorus level does. And then certain fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. These are really the last that we res will restrict because they're so uh, nutritious otherwise. So now we're gonna talk about um, the impact of nutrition on growth and, and chronic kidney disease. Since poor nutrition is the most important factor contributing to growth failure among infant and young children, it's pretty important to um, have a dietitian as part of your team. Optimizing calorie intake in your younger children with CKD is the most effective strategy to enhance uh, growth velocity. Growth failure is a major problem for patients with CKD. Yeah. The greatest risk occurs if CKD starts in your early childhood. It can be complicated by physiological linear height impairment, uremia if that's present, and developmental age lagging behind chronological age. So after infancy, growth rate correlates with your GFR where the most significant when the GFR falls below the 25th milliliters per minute, as you can see on this chart here. So what are some causes of growth impairment for children with CKD? It can be any one of these um, items listed below. Nutritional deficiency, not getting enough calories overall, not getting certain um, micronutrients, vitamins, uh, ongoing metabolic acidosis can lead to poor growth, uremia build up in the blood, that can make you feel not well, nauseous, um, poor appetite, which can then lead to poor uh, nutritional intake, electrolyte abnormalities, anemia, inflammation, and then disturbances in growth hormone metabolism and insulin-like growth factor. So typically there's, there can be spontaneous oral intake of less than 80%, and it's not uncommon for this to happen among infants and toddlers with CKD. Especially for patients who are on peritoneal dialysis, there's decreased energy intake, and it's commonly due to just feeling full from PD fluid. Um, I talk to parents about this a lot, that you know, there's only so much real estate per se with our littler patients to have the PD fluid in there and then to you have formula for good nutrition or, you know, just eating well, it can be a little bit tricky and we have to work out around the schedule of the PD um, in order to make sure we're getting adequate nutrition. A lot of patients have delay in gastric emptying, which can make them feel full longer and uncomfortable and then not eat enough or variation in toxin removal. So as a dietitian, we perform um, a full nutrition assessment. And what this looks like is we'll do a complete dietary evaluation. And this includes assessing the patient's appetite. Sometimes we use a dietary collection tool like a food record or a dietary recall. What I think works best for our pediatric population is a typical day's intake. And we'll do a, we'll do a couple days. Like what does is, what is your intake look like when you're in school? What does your intake look like when you're at home? What does your intake look like when you're visiting your Nana or um, when the babysitter has you? So we have an idea of a, a variety of how this child's intake is because it's certainly not the same every single day. If we're really struggling with finding um, why a patient's um, potassium may be high or phosphorus may be high, we may ask the family to use an app to record what the child's using uh, is eating and that's um, because that may be the easiest way for them to do that um, just being so um, with our phones being so prominent and part of our lives just to plug it right into um, a food record on their phone. We talk about the quality of the diet and potentially improving it if needed and then we'll review GI symptoms that may be occurring. We will review growth and developmental history and the frequency of which we see the patients really depends on their age and their stage of CKD. We'll look at recent and long-term growth, including 
the following anthropometrics, weight, length for less than two years, height, if we need to use um, an alternative way to measure our patients, maybe for those who can't stand, we will do a knee to height measure, a knee height measurement, and that helps us to get a better sense of what their um, height may be. Head circumference, mid upper arm circumference. Sometimes we'll use body composition tools to see, to track percent body fat if indicated. And then of course, biochemical assessment, looking at renal function trend, electrolytes, iron studies, protein markers over time. We'll calculate energy needs and we just use a, our standard pediatric equations that we use for all of our patients at Children's um, for the most part. We'll perform a nutrition focused physical exam, looking for malnutrition. We look for edema, skin breakdown, any potential um, nutritional deficiencies by assessing uh, what the patient's hair looks like. Is it thin? Is it breaking? Is it falling out? What are their nails look like? Are they strong? Are they breaking? Um, overall skin integrity, um, you know, how, how do their eyes look? Um, are they sunken? Are they puffy? We really, and sometimes the patients don't even know that we're doing this. We sometimes will do it, um, you know, on, on the sly. So, you know, if they're nervous or whatnot, um, and we'll make our notes on without even telling them if they're, if they're upset about it. But a co complete assessment includes um, any kind of indicated education, um, suggested supplements that may be rec recommended or additional nutritional lab studies and plan for additional monitoring if needed. So to evaluate for growth and nutritional status, there may be reasons why uh, more frequent monitoring is indicated if the patient has polyuria and has any kind of electrolyte um, abnormalities, there's growth delay, any comorbidities that influence growth or nutritional intake. If there's a recent acute change in medical status or dietary intake, sometimes uh, a patient is unable to meet their needs uh, PO and may require a feeding tube uh, for a short-term or a long-term Sometimes we need to use an NG tube for just a short period if they're going through an acute illness um, until they're able to eat, meet their needs 100% by mouth. But sometimes a G tube may be indicated for, for a longer time period, but not to say that that can't be removed um, later uh, because we, we frequently will put in a G tube and then it gets removed um, you know, six months, a year, two years down the line. And both have been shown to promote adequate intake and catch up growth over demand um, feeding for children with CKD. If our patients are able to eat by mouth, uh, we'll encourage some renal friendly, what we call calorie enhancers, uh, healthy oils that will suggest adding to pasta, vegetables, or heavy cream, maybe putting in a smoothie or some warm cereal. Same thing with half and half unsalted butter to vegetables or toast. Um, mayonnaise, cream cheese, and sour cream are, are other good alternatives. And then we have a variety of nutritional supplements that we use um, for our patients who really need an extra boost to meet their energy needs. The Plena is a 53 calorie per ounce nutritional supplement or 1.8 calorie per milliliter. And just in comparison, our standard pediatric supplements like Pediasure that you've probably heard of is one calorie per milliliter. So this is um, definitely more calorically dense. So one carton has 420 calories and almost 11 grams of protein. It's designed for adult patients with CKD, but we can use it frequently for our younger children who are on dialysis and may have higher protein needs. And then we have Ensure Clear, which is 200 milliliters can provide 220 calories and seven grams of protein. This is, um, this is a great supplement for our child who loves juice because it's a juice-based product and it comes in a juice box. So that is also very um, pediatric friendly. Then we have Nepro. Nepro is a 54 calorie per ounce formula. It's a very calorically dense 
along with the Saplena, uh, but it provides 19 grams of protein per serving. So it can be very uh, too high for our pediatric population, but maybe appropriate for our, our older kids or our young adults. And then there's a new product out by Kate Farms. Um, this is a plant-based product and it's also 1.8 calorie per milliliter and 20 grams of protein per carton. So this is good for our patients who can't handle a dairy-based um, formula. So super exciting to have this new supplement on board. Here are some other supplements that we frequently use. Renastart is a powder. It's suitable for children greater than one year of age. It's low in calcium, protein, chloride, phosphorus, potassium, and vitamin A. It's often mixed with other products um, as it can't be used as a sole source of nutrition, but could be mixed with, a, with another toddler formula. And it can concentrate up to two calories per milliliter, which is uh, very exciting. Then we have Carnation Instant Breakfast, where one packet alone um, is 130 calories and five grams of protein, and then the additional calories and protein for whatever milk you choose um, to add it to. Uh, we typically suggest the vanilla and strawberry version as it's lower in phosphorus, but this is a great alternative for families who want, um, may not have the means to buy some of these more expensive supplements. And it's um, easier to find. It's right in the grocery store, which is nice that it's so accessible. And then Rena Step is a newer product as well that's also two calories per milliliter and it's suitable for patients greater than one year, where one carton is 200 milliliters and 400 calories and eight grams of protein. These are some of the supplements that we use in our dialysis center. Uh, Liquicel is um, a nice alternative. It's one pouch is 30 milliliters, has 90 calories and 16 grams of protein. It's pretty sweet, but it's um, it's a nice way to in, nice way to get in a good amount of protein and just a little bit of volume. And then we have Benacalorie, where one packet's uh, one and a half ounces or 45 milliliters, 330 calories and uh, seven grams of protein. And this is a liquid, and it's it can be mixed into um, you know, maybe some oatmeal or rice cereal, and is a nice way to get in some extra, some uh, heavy duty calories. And then Nugo bars are what we choose to, to hand out as a snack um, within our dialysis center. Each Nugo bar has 170 calories and 11 grams of protein, and the kids really like them. So I thought I'd go take a minute to go over a typical day's intake of a patient who's three years old, um, goes by the initials of Elsie. So Elsie came to us and this is um, her typical day's intake. Um, so for breakfast, she has Fruit Loops with 2% milk and a banana. Lunch is chicken nuggets and French fries. Dinner, SpaghettiOs with broccoli. Her favorite snacks are Oreos and fruit snacks. And her favorite fluids to drink are chocolate milk, orange juice and water. Well, Elsie, Elsie's labs came back and her potassium and her phosphorus were a little elevated. So they asked us to take a look at her diet and see if we can make some changes. So just based on this one particular day, I went through and, and made some changes. I try not to kind of rock the world and um, you know change everything all at once, because as you can see, there's maybe some concerns for um, poor nutritional quality of some of the foods here, but I really want to address the potassium and phosphorus first, and then, then we can dig deep into talking about nutritional quality of specific foods. So for breakfast, the only thing I would really change is getting rid of the banana. The banana is a very high potassium food, and maybe switching that to strawberries if, if she likes strawberries, or even blueberries would be fine. For lunch, chicken nuggets and french fries. Again, those french fries, Potatoes are a very high potassium food. So maybe trying some alternative kid-friendly uh, vegetables like cooked carrots or even cucumber slices or something like that. Dinner, um, canned SpaghettiOs. You could try making your own version of SpaghettiOs with a fun pasta, like a wagon wheel pasta with some homemade mini meatballs. You can make a big batch and use them through the week and keep the broccoli, it's a great source of, um, it's a great vegetable. 
uh, Elsie's favorite snacks are Oreos. So you could keep the Oreos, just switch to the golden Oreos or, or even vanilla wafer cookies. Um, and fruit snacks are typically fine, although, you know, pretty high in sugar. Fluids, uh, switch the chocolate milk to a vanilla milk or, and then the orange juice to an apple juice. When we talk about uh, juice, we really encourage limiting to four to eight ounces at the most and choosing a 100% juice just because of the high sugar content. Um, we just wanna make sure it's a 100% it's a juice that they, they are drinking and then a Reno friendly version of that. So um, I just had included a slide with some resources. The PKD, PKD Foundation website has a resource link that is, uh, has endless um, lists of references. I found this uh, cookbook on that website, this Cooking Well, which looks amazing. The National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease. Um, they also have a good list of references in regards to nutrition. Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, our professional website is a good resource. The Kidney Dietitian is a, a wonderful um, blog online that has um, some great references and good recipes. On the National Kidney Foundation, I found that they had a list of apps that were really helpful. So maybe check that out if you're um, into, the, into using apps. Um, Davida, friend, uh, <laughs> Davida Kidney Care, has a fantastic database of kidney-friendly um, recipes. And from what I understand, they are, they are well-tested um, and uh, many of our patients have tried and they, these recipes and they come out great and they go back for additional recipes. So in summary, PKD may require a modified diet as the kidney function declines, intake of sodium, potassium, and phosphorus will likely have to be controlled Nutrition management in pediatrics with PKD and chronic kin kidney disease is complex, and it really requires the close involvement of, of a registered dietitian as part of your multidisciplinary team. Each, each patient requires a complete assessment to determine an individual nutrition plan and a follow-up plan. Our ultimate goal is to achieve normal growth, and with close monitoring and an of anthropometrics labs and dietary behaviors, this is what we are really aiming to do. Um, so here is my list of references. Um, and then I thought I would see if there's any questions. Okay. Uh, thank, you. Time. <laughs> thank you, Nicole. I appreciate it. This is Dwellin Williams, everyone, your hospitality host. Uh, as a reminder, please keep your microphone muted and type any questions you may have in, into the chat box. Um, we can now begin our Q&A questions if anybody has any out there. Let me see. So I see no one in the chat as of yet. Uh, we'll give it, uh, I'll say about one more minute or so, and just to see if anyone would like to uh, revisit or ask any questions or may uh, kind of like to uh, ponder. Um, you know, uh, Nicole, you know, I have a question. Um, what, what, what do you think is the, uh, the most, oh, I'm sorry, here we go. We have one question. How early do you recommend using a dietitian? Wait until labs show a need? Uh, that is from Ashley. Thank you, Ashley, for asking that. No, I think that's a great dietitian. I think the earlier on, the better. And you can really start, even if the labs are, are not abnormal, but you can start working on, you know, developing um, healthy dietary behaviors from a very young age. Um, and that's really going to help your child develop, um, you know, uh, good eating behaviors from the beginning. So I don't think it's ever too early <laughs> to, to add a dietitian. Um, and once you see it, you may just need to see a dietitian once and then follow up annually um, until, until kidney disease progresses. And then it may be more frequently, but you, you could just see one once and then see what you think. <laughs> 